Demons Discuss, Take 68, The One with So Much. Welcome to Demons Discuss, the unofficial podcast about the All Souls universe and the topics that orbit it. We are your hosts, Angela, Jean, and Valerie. I'm Valerie, and with me is Angela and Jean. Hello, ladies. Hello. Hello. Happy day a million of this pandemic. Yes. Yay! Yes. Yay! <laughs> I have to say right at the top, the Magic 8-Ball was right on both counts. We asked, will we have a better outlook? I think, I feel like I have a better outlook today. I do, too. Yes, And yes. the other one was yes. same here. Uh, about Jean's toilet paper. Will she get it? Well, she didn't get the original order, but she did get the replacement order. So, yes. yay! Yay! <laughs> Day. That's good. Yay. All in one piece, and it wasn't porch pirated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's most of the Which battle. Which is a real concern. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to have to arm ourselves to protect that house yes. from toilet yes. paper bandits. You don't want to leave it uh, too long toilet on your porch. Bandits. Not only from the bandits, but you know, anyone driving by, she has toilet paper. Listen. Oh, my God. I have a new appreciation for my hunter-gatherer husband who brought home some Mark Howell paper towels. Normally, we use V in this house, but we got some off-brand, no-name shit, and I was just happy for it. Thank you. <laughs> oh, man. You know what? I have learned sometimes you do not need to scoff the off-brand because the Trader Joe brand of paper towels is awesome. Wow. It's like having those. It's it's more than paper towel. It's like those nice little, when you pull out your wipes. Mm-hmm. The, like the Clorox wipes, there's more than paper. There, it's like there's like cloth strands mm. in it. Oh. it. It's almost like a shop towel. You need to be a nice. Trader Joe's ambassador. They don't realize what a gem they have in you, Jean. Because I don't, I don't even bother shopping. I just go well, for your recommendations. I sho- <laughs> well, I was just shocked because I'm like, oh, I do need paper towel. And then I bought, grabbed it a while ago. I'm like, yeah, I'll try some of theirs. Because right? I usually like to just, get, I go to Target and buy all my paper products based on what's on sale. Right. So I was always a big Target store brand person. I can say the same and about Amazon's uh, toilet paper. Ooh. The Presto brand. Presto. Mm, Presto. Okay. Yes. It happened to come on sale when my daughter called me. She's like, there's no toilet paper in Seattle, Bob. And I opened up Amazon and there it was. It's available. So I Jeff Bezos. Yep. <laughs> it's pretty good. Normally we use the Cottonelle, but this is all right. I'm, I, I wasn't hating on it. So yeah. <laughs> There's our happy for today, audience. Yeah. Woo! Yes. <laughs> Paper products. We're expanding our horizon. We are. Okay, so <laughs> back to the subject at hand. What are we talking about today, Angela? We are starting our engines and taking a maiden voyage into the Book of Life, starting with Chapter 1. Yay! Yay! <laughs> And we have new attitudes about it. We're going into it fresh. Yeah. Yes. That's, that's what's happening yes. here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was a lot. Chapter, I don't, I didn't remember chapter one being a lot, but man, it, it really was a dense chapter. That's our title. Maybe it was because we were just dying to have all of our questions answered that I powered yeah. through it. Yeah, True. I think so. True. So let's take this opportunity to thank our patrons for supporting us, even through these weird and difficult times, right? Yes. Uh, That's so, so thankful for everyone sticking with us and making our days a little bit better, too. Yeah. We have stuff to look forward to. And this is one of the things when we get to sit down and talk to you guys. Mm -hmm. So this podcast, as you listeners know, is sponsored by listeners just like you. And we couldn't exist at the level we do without them. So, Gene, tell our listeners what advantages there are to supporting us? The biggest advantage to supporting us is that you will get extra episodes on the off weeks with our after show, which are always a potpourri of topics and issues and basically things that are bugging us or questions that you ask Lately, us. a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Gr- grab bag yeah. is probably an appropriate way to term it, but you get that no matter what level you sponsor us at. As the levels move up, you get lovely swag all designed by Valerie. It, everything from stickers to to cool holographic stickers mm. and tote bags and whatever interesting things we can dream up. Oh, I forgot one more one thing. One more thing. There's always the, the extra Patreon content on the Patreon website. Oh, yes. Yes, there, there is stuff. Valerie always comes up with more entertaining stuff to read <laughs> over there, too. <laughs> 
<laughs> for all of the five listeners that go and read that stuff, thank you. I appreciate you. Yay. Well, I would, I would, I'm just trying to get, you know, the other, our other five listeners to go over there and read your Patreon missives. Yes. Yes. Normally it's once a month. Uh, I give information on how we're doing on our fundraising goals, how we're doing, what we're doing this month, uh, what our plans are, whether they come to fruition or not. Uh, <laughs> and sorry. Sorry if they didn't, but here's some more shit. You know, that's, that's pretty <laughs> much to keep us honest. Basically, yeah. basically, I keep us honest by posting all these things and saying, "Oh, we didn't do that. Oops, sorry." <laughs> but anyway, bye guys. <laughs> bye guys. If you're interested in joining, go to patreoncom demons discuss and let's roll into discuss your emails. Who's got something for us? I do. I have something from Samantha Reeves. Hi, Samantha. Hello, welcome, Hi, Samantha. She says, my dearest demons, I am, quote, answering my fucking email, end quote. Yay! (laughs) Yay. She cannot refuse one of Baldwin's demands, she says. That's true. I find... I find the opening lines of the book so perfect. Ghosts did not have much substance. All they were composed of were memories and heart. I read them and was once again hooked on what would become my favorite book of the series. I love the ghosts of the All Souls universe. I love that just outside the perception of living, the characters we've lost still exist. Having Emily there talking to Philippe just as news of her death was delivered was something I found very comforting. It's very similar to the way I envision my own family members who have passed on. I believe they're still around, checking up on us. I'm sure many of other readers feel the same. But I do find it heartbreaking for Philippe to have watched Isabeau for so many years, and in her grief, she could never see him. Mm -hmm. One of the things I love the most about the book of life is so many characters coming together and interacting, and this chapter has one of my favorite moments, Fernando and Galaglass in the kitchen. A lot of important information is revealed in their conversation, but it just feels so casual. Dom Fernando is in his bare feet cooking in Mart's kitchen with his stepson. It's lovely. I'm so excited we've made it to the book of life. Now let's get to Baldwin. Sending love and hugs in this crazy time, Samantha Reeves. Thanks, Samantha. Oh yes, let's 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 get to Baldwin. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot we got to get through before we get to oh, yeah, Baldwin. Yeah. Go ahead, Jean. What do you have? Okay. I have one from our journeyman demon, Zoe. Yay, Zoe. <laughs> she named Zoe. She put herself at the rank of journeyman. <laughs> right. Yes. I love it. She, 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 she's been promoted. Just her yes. rank. It's wonderful. Yes. And she, I'm glad she's recognized yes. it. Yep. I hope all is well with you lovely ladies and your lovely families. Thank you for the check-in episode and after show (laughs) pre-show. What we all needed in these strange days and that was much appreciated. You're welcome. Are y'all still working full-time from home? I was at first, but now I've been furloughed for up to two months. It's a weird feeling. It's a weird feeling and I've decided to how best to spend my days. At the moment, I'm working through my TBR list and catching up on some box sets around my allowed daily outdoor exercise, but might need to come up with a better plan. Anyways, to business. Wow. The book of life already. Firstly, I love the dedication, often attributed to Charles Darwin. Mm-hmm. LOL. Gotta love Philippe. Yep. Chapter one then, and I'm going to focus on the ghosts. The depiction of the ghosts is interesting. For example, judging by the description of Philippe, still handsomer than any man has a right to be. He appears as he was in life rather than his torture and death. Mm. Elsewhere, ghosts are often portrayed with injuries, headless or nearly headless, like Sir Nicholas and Harry Potter. Also, the theory that ghosts can only appear to the living when they have moved on, not because they need something. Mm. But don't we normally think the dead need something from us? Certainly, if you believe what you see on these ghost hunter or psychic investigation documentary programs. Hmm. Yeah, they're needy, like our Jerry. Yeah. Very needy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But this new information does help Philippe somewhat, so it's all good. Also interesting that Emma is described as being more perceptive. Being a ghost improves your senses, all six of them. Good to know for future reference, maybe? Mm. The appearance of Rebecca at the end of the chapter is a bit of a surprise, even on the nth reread, though. Ghosts can move or be called to somewhere that they've never been. What? Mm. It must be a family thing? I doubt all the ghosts in the Bishop house they actually live there in life. Other thoughts on chapter one. Endings, beginnings, change. This seems to be the theme of the book of life in three words. I like the way the characters are revealed slowly, like the story of M's death and in pairs. Emily and Philippe, Marcus and Phoebe, Fernando and Galloglass. There's also a brief reappearance of petulant teenage Diana. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Her stubbornness in not believing M is dead. Mm-hmm. And 
promised she would never leave without saying goodbye. Why does she think that they would make that up? That would be a really cruel joke to play after nine months. I know. Ha ha. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Oops. Yeah. Perhaps I should cut her some slack and put, put it down to shock. Mm. It's a great first chapter with a lot of details revealed and sets the scene for the rest of the book. Before I go, a funny thing. One of those things going around on Facebook at the moment, you know, those things, mm. whatever was number one when you're when you were 12 is your quarantine song. Mine? Fernando by ABBA. Whoa. Seriously. Nice. It really was number one then in the UK anyways. Much love to you all and stay safe. Zoe, your journeyman demon. Oh, thank you, that. Zoe. Did you... Thank you, Did you Zoe. guys do now yours? I have to look and see what. No, oh. you want to do it right quick. No, Let's uh, do while it. you look, oh, mine was that. kind of a dud, a classic song, but it was Jack and Diane. Okay, so what am I looking for? Okay. I'm actually looking for number one song year... on your birthday, the year you're uh, 19, when you were 12. When I was 12. Oh shit. Okay. Uh, so that'd be 81. <laughs> I think. <laughs> I don't know. There's so many numbers in between then and now. <laughs> it's, it's math. It's way too, too much math. All the math. Endless love. Oh, that's nice. Oh, yeah. What was Come that? On, uh, that was uh, Lionel. Lionel Richie and uh, Diana mm -hmm. Ross. Yeah. Okay. I love that song. Okay. This is going to be scary. <laughs> that would drive me crazy. So let's. If you leave me now by Chicago. If you oh, leave my God. Me now. I remember oh, being in my, my aunt's uh, Malibu, Chevy Malibu, like the original Chevy Malibu, hearing that song. <laughs> okay, but this this is a UK website, so maybe I'm safe. Let me try one more. Okay. <laughs> Did you not like that song, Jean? No, I just got an earworm. Now. <laughs> I know. That's, it won't leave. That's what I was going to say. If if this was like Bishop style, Bishop House style, we'd have to hear. I'd have to hear Jack and Diane for this whole duration. <laughs> oh my god. Oh no 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 no. Little did he. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> don't, even, don't even start. Don't even start. It's too late. It's happened. <laughs> it is, let's see, for the U.S., it was Rockin' Me by Steve Miller Band. I don't know if that's much better or not. <laughs> well, that's, that's the week of my birthday. The week after my birthday is Rod Stewart. Tonight's the night. Oh, that's okay. That's good. better. Stick with that yeah. one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll stick with that one. <laughs> and if anybody asks, that's the one where that's the one we're saying. No one's going to verify. The one. Yeah. <laughs> now, see, if you were the same number of years old as I was, Valerie, you would have your, it's either you should be dancing or shake your booty. I like that. Oh, shit. Shake your booty. <laughs> That's quite an array of genres there. Yeah. <laughs> of number ones. Angela, you had a fifth of Beethoven. Oh, I was in oh, the disco area. Week. Week. The disco yeah. version. No, yeah, it was It was like the whole, I think it was Saturday Night Fever. Yeah. All of those songs that was the best was the version Saturday Night anyway. Fever soundtrack. Dun, dun, so. dun, 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 dun. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's in my head now, too. <laughs> All right, let's finish this discussory email from Chloe. <laughs> hey, Chloe. Hey, Chloe. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We got distracted. Our journeyman demon distracted us. Yes. Anyway. Like a good demon does. Uh, <laughs> absolutely. Hi, demons. In Australia, we are not in full lockdown yet. I'm classified as an essential worker. So like it or not, I still have to go into work and deal with the public. Well, hang in there. Hang in there. Yep. When I'm home, I have university online as well as a potential book I'm working on. It's nonfiction. Oh, go you, Chloe. Just do it. Now on to the book. When I opened the book, I was shocked to see that Emily was dead. I didn't notice in the last book when I read because I was too impatient to get to the next book. Seeing Philippe back was weird, but happy. I hope we get James Purefoy as his ghost in the third mm. season. I hope so, too. Me too. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Mm. Something that struck me was how immediate Matthew's blood rage was now that they were back. He was almost frothing at the mouth with it so close under his skin. Yeah, I agree. One particular part grabbed my attention. Marcus warning Phoebe, do not under any circumstance get within arm's reach of my father. Agreed? At the end of that passage, the warning about Matthew, I want to know your thoughts on it, demons. Why was Marcus so scared to let Phoebe near Matthew, but not scared about the rest of the family? Anyway, that's all from me. Stay safe, stay sane, stay relatively sober. Your vampire mm -hmm. down under Chloe. <laughs> We're trying with the relatively sober thing. Yeah, sometimes it's touch and go some days. Yeah. 
Okay, so let's get to that. Um, she wants to know why Marcus was so protective. And my main instinct is to say she's human. She's one of the only humans yeah, in the he house. Didn't want to re- he didn't want a repeat of the Eleanor Legere. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I scenario. think it's just yeah. the mating instinct also. It's almost, it can be irrational. That too. Yeah. Hyperprotectiveness. Yeah. He was just as irrational as his dad. Yeah. yeah, there you go. I hope that's satisfactory, Chloe. I hope that works for you. If not, you know, mm-hmm. come up with your own theories. I don't know. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> <It's> whatever. <laughs> okay, so let's start the wagon. This chapter discussion is brought to you by Kimberly Babcock. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we've closed Shadow of Night and have left the past firmly behind us. And we open up this next volume with bated breath and find a couple of familiar presences. The ghosts of Emily and Philippe commenting on current events. So let's uh, talk about that. What were your feelings, thoughts? Let's go back to first read when you first read this. Here we go. This was the, this very first section was the section that we got with USA Today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For the most part, which turns out it wasn't all of chapter one like we were led to believe. Right. Right. (laughs) Right. Well, let me let me just like, back up. What did you think about soul and cancer? Did you think of that little reading as a signification of what's to come in this chapter? Or well, let's read it yeah. here. Soul and cancer, the sign of the crab, pertains to houses, lands, treasures, and whatever is hidden. It's the fourth house of the zodiac. It signifies death and the end of things. So, what did I think of that? Uh, I just thought it was kind of a prelude of things to expect. I think that was my initial impression. It almost feels like an outline for this chapter because this chapter is really a trans... It's not a first chapter per se. It's a transition. Yes. Especially the way it shifts between past and present. Yeah. Mm. It's like you're in this liminal space before we totally jump back into the 21st century. And not only is it a catch up, but the way Deb twists time around and on itself with not only the shifting POVs, but the shifting time all within one chapter, which is kind of weird. Yeah. You don't see time shifts like that, especially that many contained within a single chapter. Well, the soul and cancer, it kind of sectioned chapters into like a certain group of chapters Mm -hmm. into Mm -hmm. new phases into the book. I think after I finished this group of chapters, that all made sense to me. And then when I went back and looked, it's like, oh, yeah, check. We covered yeah, that. Boom. We covered yeah. that. So, I thought it was appropriate. Yeah. I rarely look at something like death and the end of things or the death card and tarot cards as a bad thing. And I just thought, oh, OK. I almost like no. see a double negative and go, oh, yeah. it's a new beginning. Yeah, that's interesting because me, I'm like, oh, God, gloom and doom. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's get into it. Ghosts didn't have much substance. All they were composed of were memories and heart. Atop one of Septor's round towers, Emily Mather pressed a diaphanous hand against the spot in the center of her chest that even now was heavy with dread. She says, does it ever get easier? The watching, the waiting, the knowing. And Philippe says, not that I've noticed. He was perched nearby, studying his own transparent fingers. Of all things Philippe disliked about being dead, the inability to touch his wife, Isabeau, his lack of smell or taste, the fact that he had no muscles for a good sparring match. Invisibility topped the list. It was a constant reminder of how inconsequential he had become. Emily's face fell. It ties into our discuss our email talking about how Emily is more perceptive, but it's also kind of interesting because it seems like as ghosts, you lose three of your five senses. All you've got left to is your sight and hearing Yeah, Mm -hmm. because no taste, no touch, no smell, no taste. Yeah. So that's kind of interesting. What kind of like freaked me out about this is his eyesight was still vampire. Right. But his smell wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. All right. Well, the fact that the, the no muscles is also, it's like so much of his vampireness is kind of sucked right. out of him. Yeah. It's like, yay, you're still around, but you're left with this. So have yeah. fun. <laughs> <You know? laughs> All right. Emily's face fell and Philippe silently cursed himself. Since she's died, the witch had become his constant companion, cutting his loneliness in two. What was he thinking? Barking at her as if she was a servant. I guess I should have barked that because I, n- I, I never I understood that. that. I never understood. Uh, yeah, yeah. it's like, was he like, yeah. not that I've noticed. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I thought he was just, you know, not that I've noticed. Right. So Philippe 
comes back and says, perhaps it'll be easier when they don't need us anymore, Philippe said in a gentler tone. He might be the more experienced ghost, but it was Emily who understood the metaphysics of their situation. What the witch had told him went against everything Philippe believed about the afterworld. He thought the living saw the dead because they needed something from them. Assistance, forgiveness, retribution. Emily insisted these were nothing more than human myths, and it was only when the living moved on and can let go that the dead could appear to them. So, I don't know, Angela, do you find that to be true? <laughs> <laughs> I find it to be true. There's two categories. There are the ghosts that are still here and haven't crossed over, and I, th- I think those are the ones that do need something from you, or do need, not, not something mm-hmm. from you, but they need to tell a message, or they need to, they're confused. Then you have the other ones who accomplish yes, something, accomplish something yeah. yet, and there's other ones that have moved on, and those are the ones that you hear like from the medium, like, oh, your grandfather just appeared, and he wanted to say he still, he loves you, and he's, everything's fine, and you know, those are the ones that are there for comfort, the ones who have moved on. They've learned that otherness on the other side. Right, they're just dropping in to be like, you're all right, man. It's cool. Yeah, Keep exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. I do get that card in uh, my card set where it's message from above. And it, the description says your loved ones who have moved on want you to know that everything is fine. That's good. Yeah. That's got to be yes. comforting, I it think. It is. It is. It, especially because of if I'm thinking about something in particular and I get that card, it's like, oh, OK, that's a good reminder. OK, there you go. All right. So Philippe is thinking this information made Isabeau's failure to notice him somewhat easier to bear, but not much. I can't wait to see Em's reaction. She's going to be so surprised. And this is Diana. And they're observing her. Diana and Matthew. Emily and Philippe said in unison, peering down to the cobbled courtyard that surrounded the chateau. There, Philippe said, pointing at the drive. They are a fine couple, are they not? Look how much my son has changed. So this was a surprise to me reading this. I'm like, oh, OK, maybe Matthew did what he was supposed to do. <laughs> well, what was also so funny about this this whole uh, chapter is that Emily is the one that's noting he's still handsomer than any man he had a right to be. <laughs> and this is from a gay woman. So, <laughs> you know, that's really that was, saying something. <laughs> that's saying he's really handsome. <laughs> There is something aesthetically pleasing about it. Right. Vampires weren't supposed to be altered by passing of time. Therefore, Emily expected to see the same black hair, so dark it glinted blue, the same mutable gray-green eyes, cool and remote as the winter sea, the same pale skin and wide mouth. There were a few subtle differences, though, as Philippe suggested. Matthew's hair was shorter, and he had a beard that made him look even more dangerous, like a pirate. She gasped. Is Matthew bigger? And Philippe all proud of himself. He's like, he is. <laughs> I, <love that. laughs> I fattened him up when he and Diana were here in 1590. Books were making him soft. Puny. Matthew needed <laughs> Puny. That's <laughs> right. Puny. The puny son. <laughs> Matthew needed to fight more and read less. Philippe had always contended that there was such a thing as too much education. Matthew was living proof of it. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And I love the I love the comment about looking like a pirate. Like made me think yeah. of Walter for Walter. a second. Mm-hmm. Oh. So Emily notes, Diana looks different too. More like a mother with that long coppery hair. Emmett said, acknowledging the most obvious change in her niece. Diana stumbled on a cobblestone and Matthew's hand shot out to steady her. Once Emily had seen Matthew's incessant hovering as a sign as overprotectiveness. Now, with a perspicacity, did I say that right? Perspicacity mm-hmm. of a ghost. She realized that mm-hmm. this tendency stemmed from a preternatural awareness of every change in Diana's expression. Every shift or mood, every sign of fatigue or hunger. Today, however, Matthew's concerns seem even more focused and acute. It's not just Diana's hair that changed. And this is Philippe. Diana's with child. Matthew's child. And I can picture him being giddy. Yay! Right. It, it worked. <laughs> and then Emily says, you mean with children? Diana is having twins. And Philippe's like, twins? Ooh. Yay. Yeah. The enhanced grasp of truth that doth afford. Yes. Yes. Somehow I think we're going to be revisiting that right. concept at some point in time. It feels like what they see, it's like it's the absolute truth. It's not opinion. They just know it to be mm-hmm. true. Yeah. Well, 
And I can't help but think in future books, too, that we're going to see that concept expand and evolve, especially since we seem to have more ghosts coming into the stories mm. as time, yes. you know, as they go on. We get the other ghosts and Times Convert and whatnot. So that statement really struck me this time. Mm. It's another one where I've got stars and highlighting. <laughs> <laughs> All your highlights and stars. <laughs> yes. All right. So Philippe says, look, here are Isabeau and Sarah with Sophie and Margaret. And Emily wants to know what will happen now, Philippe. And uh, Philippe says, endings, beginnings, change. And Emily's like, Diana never liked change. And Philippe says, that's because Diana is afraid of what she must become. That had Amble. me be like, da, da, there's da, a, da. There's like, oh my God. Yeah, there's a, an, the anvil just yes. dropped right there. Right. What must she become? Like, what? Well, and, and afraid. Right. Ooh. <laughs> it's like, ooh, didn't see that anvil first time around. Right. Now I'm go. reading it. I'm like, oh, shit, I missed this this last time. Yeah. God. There's a hint. <laughs> There's a not so subtle hint. Right. Okay. So star, star, star. That means we've changed scenes ooh. here. <laughs> <laughs> and changed points of view. Right. Marcus Whitmore had faced horrors of plenty since the night of 1781 when Matthew de Claremont made him a vampire. None had prepared him for today's ordeal, telling Diana Bishop that her beloved aunt, Emily Mather, was dead. Okay, pause. I don't, mm. I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but now that you know what happened in Times Convert, this is like a whole new faced horrors of plenty. Yes, he did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Anything else? That's it. Anything nope, else? That's it. All right. Back to Marcus. Yep. Back to the other scene. Back to Marcus. Yep. And his damn phone. He keeps getting these awful phone calls on that phone. You might want to get a new one. <laughs> I know. Bad luck. The cursed damn. phone. <laughs> it's a cursed phone as opposed to the cursed child. Okay. So we're having a flashback here and I guess I'll read that. <laughs> Marcus had received a phone call from Isabel while he and Nathaniel Wilson were watching the television news in the family library. Sophie, Nathaniel's wife, and their baby, Margaret, were dozing off in a nearby sofa. The temple, Isabel had said breathlessly, her tone frantic. Come at once. Marcus had obeyed his grandmother without question, only taking the time to shout for his cousin Galglass and his aunt Varen on his way out the door. The summer half-light of evening had lightened further as he approached the clearing at the top of the mountain, frightened by the otherworldly power that Marcus glimpsed through the trees. His hair stood at attention with a magic in the air. Then he scented the presence of a vampire, Gerber of Orlac, someone else. Oh, and someone else, a witch. Mm. And once again, he senses magic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like when he met Phoebe. It's like he's the only vampire so far, I think, that has been noted to sense to him. kind of feel it in the air, to sense it in the air like like it's lightning coming. Yeah, I think Matthew, though, does sense it, too, because he has mentioned he's like, I smell it. You right, know? right, right. Yeah, I, I mean, that, that's why I'm just saying I'm saying Matthew, Matthew smell, can smell the magic, but it seems like the way Deb describes it for markets is more tactile. Maybe, maybe. I'm wondering if it's different for different vampires or maybe it's only like the Claremont men who can sense the magic. I would say that'd be a leap, but sure, I'm, maybe. Well, <laughs> and then you have... I'm, just spin, I'm spinning here. <laughs> yeah. so. Then you have the TV show, which it seems... Like even Domenico can't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we don't get to spend enough time with Domenico, so it's hard yeah. to tell. Yeah, not in these books. A light purposeful step sounded down the stone corridor, drawing Marcus out of the past and back into the present. The heavy door opened, creaking as it always did. And this was Phoebe. And Marcus says, hello, sweetheart. And we just went through all that lerve shit with him. So obviously we know yeah. that, you know, Marcus <laughs> lerves the Phoebe. <laughs> mm -hmm. Marcus turned from the view of the Auvergne countryside and drew a deep breath. Phoebe Taylor's scent reminded him of the thicket of lilac bushes that had grown outside the red painted door of his family farm. Delicate and resolute, the fragrance had symbolized the hope of spring after a long Massachusetts winter and conjured up his long dead mother's understanding smile. Now it only made Marcus think of the petite iron-willed woman in front of him. Hmm. And it was a Revolutionary War era Airwick, yes. too, by the way. <laughs> That's why they always planted them by the door. I loved that. I mean, first we get the mention of Varen. Oh, new character. And then we get new sense. You know, yes. that's you hope that that's going to continue uh -huh. in the rest of the story. Right. And then the fact that the Phoebe scent reminds him of his mom, too. I like mm -hmm. that. Hmm. So Phoebe's trying to reassure him and saying, uh, everything will be all right. 
and she straightened his collar, her olive eyes full of concern. Marcus had taken to wearing more formal clothes than the concert t-shirts around the same time he started to sign his letters, Marcus de Claremont instead of Marcus Whitmore. So what'd you guys think of that? I mean, was that just a shift in his position? When does somebody take on the de Claremont name versus? Well, he's also the grand, Mar- uh, the grand master now. So right. He needs the power of the right. name behind him. Right. And it's really kind of interesting because now Philippe is saying, you know, endings, beginnings change. We saw an ending and in, in the fact that now we know everybody knows that M's dead. Now he's we're kind of like going through all the changes that Marcus has gone through. Yeah. From the clothes he's wearing to how he signs his name to the fact that he's got a girl with him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. So Marcus Whitmore, the name she'd first known him by before he had told her about vampires, 1500 year old fathers, French castles filled of forbidding re- relatives and a witch named Diana Bishop. It was, in Marcus's opinion, nothing short of miraculous that Phoebe had remained at his side. And my opinion, too, because yes. <laughs> Mine as well. Yeah. Seriously, Phoebe? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't run away with your hair on fire? Wow. I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta go. They always say humans don't have much sense in this series. Though. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Matthew doesn't get it. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. So Marcus is saying, uh, after she had said, everything's going to be all right, Marcus is saying, no, it won't. For the final time, Marcus Whitmore, and this is Phoebe, I will be standing by your side when you greet your father and his wife. I don't believe we need to discuss it further. She threw down the gauntlet. I have spoken. Right. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and what they're really saying is, OK, it's going to get worse before it gets better. But <laughs> we're both right. 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 <laughs> yeah. So Phoebe held out her hand and said, shall we? And this is Marcus. Very well. But if you come down with me, Phoebe, there are conditions. First, you're with me or Isabeau at all times. And Phoebe's like, but, but second, if I tell you to leave the room, you will do so. No delay. No questions. Go straight to Fernando. And this is why I was excited. I'm like, oh, we're going to be Fernando. Yay! Yay! So Fernando, he'll be in the chapel or the kitchen. Marcus searched her face and saw a wary acceptance. Third, do not under any circumstances get within an arm's reach of my father. Agreed? And Phoebe nodded. And I'm just thinking to myself, she's like, yeah, all right, pal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like any good diplomat, she was prepared to follow Marcus's rules for now. But if Marcus's father was the monster some in the house seemed to think he was, Phoebe would do what she must. So I like that she she's not taking anybody's opinion at the more than what it is, like an opinion that she's right. waiting to make That's her own. Point. Right. I love that. I love that it pointed out that Marcus wasn't so sure of his father's temperament. Yeah. Around people he didn't know. But he spent the last nine months also pretty much listening to everybody else's stories about how his father flies off the handle. Right. Right. Between the knights and his Aunt Baron and his Uncle Baldwin. Right. And And I wonder how many readers were still shocked to see how much he was feared by his own family. I know I was. Even after going through Shadow of Night. I don't know. Because when you go through a Discovery Witches, we learn to love Matthew. Yeah. And we we see him as this cuddly, sometimes dangerous vampire. But his family saw him as... Yeah, his family of vampires (laughs) thought he was the black sheep. Yeah. Out of control, the the fucking yeah. <laughs> the weak link, the the one that you have to watch. So yeah. I wonder how much of an eye opener was that for readers? You know, yeah. yeah. Well, and, and we we really wrestled with that concept a lot back in the day too, mm-hmm. before we had all the information, yes. it, especially after in the in between time before this book came out, and then it's like, okay, wait a minute, here comes some more information about Matthew. Right. Matthew. And then if you look back and people w- were resisting it, but Matthew told us exactly who he was. Yeah. Yeah. He, he t- oh, gosh. He was very clear. V- very clear. And especially when he was explaining it to Hamish and Hamish is like, Hamish was in non-belief. He's like, nah, he- you're a good guy. No problem. No, you don't understand, dude. These are the things I did. You know, <laughs> Matthew told us who he was. So, yeah, Hamish believed him some, too, because yeah, he pulls Diana aside saying, mm-hmm. hey, you need to know these right. things. And she's like, ah, nah. <laughs> he's my cuddly vampire. Nah. 
Do you remember back in the day, though, in the discussion group, we had said he's a black sheep and Deb said, maybe he's just scripted that way. And now I can kind mm, of see yep, it because he's exactly. the assassin and he that is his role. He, that is his script. He slotted into yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's that black sheep because Philippe amped up all of those attributes. Yes. And that's what his family saw. He turned them all on blast. And, and it's not fair a lot of times. You know, you have that role and you do a lot of really bad things. And you have, he's, of all people, Matthew's got to live with it. He's got to carry it and feel bad about it and atone yeah. for it. But they right. throw it in his face sometimes. Like, well, at least I don't do this. It's like, right. <laughs> that's yeah. my role. I'm sorry. So Ooh. I am scripted that way. I wonder how many, yeah. how much of his family saw him when he was brooding and being into poetry and his quiet times. He was only exposed to them when he was fulfilling his role in the family. Mm -hmm. So the quiet time, the, the poetry and the vulnerability was not viewed as a positive because the, he always want, Philippe was always trying to squash that out of Hugh too. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So that's not, so, I don't think that's something that any of the other siblings would necessarily look at as a desirable trait either. No, and they want him to be the successful soldier that he is, but they don't want to deal with the trauma that comes with it. No. That's true. Yeah, it's like your PTSD inconveniences right. me. Yeah. Philippe's role was to make sure they can defend whatever cause they were defending, and everybody had yeah. a role. And how much of yourself gets lost in that role? There we go. So, mm -hmm. star, 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 that means we're in a new scene. Ooh. Yay! <laughs> Shift, shift of gears. All right. We're, dri we're driving the manual transmission today. That's right. Awesome. <laughs> Gear shifting. We're shifting up into third right now. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> the flywheel grinds right here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Fernando Gonsalves poured beaten eggs into the hot skillet, blanketing the brown potatoes already in the pan. His tortilla española was one of the few dishes Sarah Bishop would eat. And today, of all days, the widow needed sustenance. So what did you guys think of this opening when we meet Fernando? Not at all what I thought. No. I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A man who cooks, I'm hungry now. <laughs> Yeah, he was not at all what I thought. Uh, I thought Fernando was this. And it just keeps coming because he's barefoot. He's this. He's got his crisp white shirt. It's mm -hmm. like, well. Hello. <laughs> 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 Okay. Gal Glass sat at the t kitchen table picking drops of wax out of a crack in the ancient boards. With his collar length, blonde hair, and muscular build, he looked like a morose bear. Tattoos snaked around his forearms and biceps in bright swirls of color. Their subject matter revealed whatever was on Gal Glass's mind at the moment. For a tattoo lasted only a few months on a vampire. Right now, he seemed to be thinking about his roots. For his arms were covered with Celtic knots work, runes, and the fabulous beasts drawn from the Norse and Gaelic myths and legends. So, uh, Jean, you had something to say about the tattoos. Yeah. Like I said, we were like pouring through this so fast for answers that this right here, it's like two really significant passages. Whatever was on Gallo Glass's mind at the moment, mm -hmm. and the fact that nowhere was anything said about a mermaid or a siren. Right. Because they're not necessarily considered beasts. Right. And a little bit later on here, we'll mention that Cora was one of the tattoos that was on his arm. Right. And this really got my gears sinking. And it's something we need to like put on our checklist as we go through this, because since tattoos only last for a few months at a time, mm -hmm. the really significant tattoo that's going to come up way later on is months down the road. So that made me think is like, did he go into some damn tattoo shop <laughs> late at night and get that siren <laughs> tattoo either refreshed, refreshed or, or So we, had, we have to see if on. it's continuity or if it's deliberate. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> it, it, it really kind of piqued my interest there because you know me and timelines. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it might have been this passage was hiding in plain sight all that time. And when Deb finally answered our question at the con one year. Yeah. And we talked all about love, actually. So right. that, that might be right in this little bit right here. Maybe he wanted to send that message. Yes. Mm, selfish Maybe it's prick. not 400 years of being <laughs> morose. Let me stop with a selfish prick talk. <laughs> There'll be time Save for that. For later. That'll, there will be time There's, for that. We'll have lots of time for that. Right, right, right. Okay. Uh, disregard. Stop worrying. <laughs> disregard, audience. <laughs> We're going to proceed. All right. 
So Fernando says, stop worrying. And Galglass looked up for a moment and then returned to his attention to the wax. And uh, Fernando says, no one will prevent Matthew from doing what he must, Galglass. Avenging Emily's death is a matter of honor. Fernando turned off the heat and joined Galglass at the table bare feet moving silently across the flagstone floors. As he walked, he rolled down the sleeves of his white shirt. It was pristine in spite of the hours he'd spent in the kitchen that day. He tucked the shirt into the waistband of his jeans and he ran his fingers through his dark, wavy hair. Deb got it wrong because it's the rolling up the sleeves. That's the catnip. (laughs) (laughs) She reversed it. Yeah. Marcus is going to try to take the blame, you know, Galaglass said. But Emily's death wasn't the boy's fault. And uh, we're doing some flashbacks, so I'll play some flashback music here. Uh, The scene on the mountain had been oddly peaceful, considering the circumstances. Galaglass had arrived at the temple a few moments after Marcus. There had been nothing but silence and the sight of Emily Mather kneeling inside a circle marked out with pale rocks. The witch Peter Knox had been with her, his hands on her head, and a look of anticipation, even hunger, on his face. Gerbert of Orlac, the de Clermont's nearest vampire neighbor, was looking down with interest. Emily! Sarah's anguished cry had torn through the silence with such force that even Gerbert stepped back. Startled, Knox released Emily. She crumpled to the ground, unconscious. Sarah beat the other witch back with a single powerful spell that sent Knox flying across the clearing. No, Marcus didn't kill her, Fernando said, drawing back Galaglass's attention. But his negligence, and Galaglass is tr- still trying to defend Marcus here, inexperience, negligence, Fernando repeated, did play a role in this tragedy. Marcus knows that and accepts the responsibility for it, which is important. Responsibility. Anyway. (laughs) Were you thinking about this whole pandemic right now? Yes, I was. (laughs) Yes, me too. (laughs) (laughs) And here's what what I think is, just as we're sitting here right now, which which is really interesting, is that Marcus is more mature than Galaglass in a lot of ways. As Fernando is saying, is like Marcus accepted his responsibility and accepted that it was negligence and Galaglass keeps trying to say, no, no, it was just an experience. You know, it's not his fault when he's so much older, which to me Mm -hmm. kind of speaks to the whole coddled grandchild role he's had all those years because Marcus was never coddled. Not by his father. Not not by Philippe either. Right. The way that Galaglass was. So maybe Isabeau was the soft place for Marcus to land in that whole equation. Yeah. And I don't think that was, I mean, when we went through uh, Times Convert, I don't think that was necessary. She was necessary that early on. Right. I feel like Galaglass was projecting a little bit. Like, I didn't ask to be the errand boy throughout all this to hide the right. stuff and watch over Diana. And then in the next sentence, yeah. it talks about Fernando nominating Marcus and Matthew agreeing. And just like Galaglass got nominated and Philippe's like, yep, he's the guy. Yeah. Galaglass is like, yeah, oh, like, shit. Yeah. <laughs> here, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, we're, we're going to be the two to blame, me and Marcus. Right. Yeah. We're getting set up yeah. here. This is bullshit. <laughs> I see this bullshit coming down the right, road. Right. So as Angela said, Galaglass said, Marcus didn't ask to be in charge. And then Fernando's like, no, I nominated for him for the position. And Matthew agreed it was the right decision. Fernando's like, pat, pat. <laughs> yeah. He pressed Galaglass's shoulder briefly and returned to the stove. Is that why you came? And this is Gal Glass to Fernando. Is that why you came? Because you felt guilty about refusing to leave the Brotherhood when Matthew asked for your help? And I feel like he's placing blame here a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like, you could have been in charge. You could have been right. well, handling I, I this. I feel like Gal yeah. is also saying, like, you and Matthew don't want to be wrong in this. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. No one had been more surprised than Gal Glass when Fernando turned up at Septor. Fernando had avoided the place ever since Gal Glass's father, Hugh de Clermont, died in the 14th century. I'm here because Matthew was there for me after the French king executed Hugh. I was alone in the world then, except for my grief. Fernando's tone was harsh, and I refuse to leave the Knights of Lazarus because I'm not a de Clermont. And Galaglas is like, but your father's mate. You were as much a de Clermont as Isabeau or her children. And Fernando's shutting the oven door. I am Hugh's mate. Your father will never be past tense to me. And I thought that was deep. I was mm-hmm. like a kick punch in the gut. Yeah. Like, could you imagine being in 
in stasis so long with mm-hmm. you're still mated to somebody who is dead. And then I thought about Miriam for some reason. Do you know? Right. It's like mm. it's like she's still tied to Bertrand or so. Yeah, I was going to say, and of course, the, the woman handles it more quietly and with less drama. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> So saying. <laughs> and Galaglass says, uh, sorry, Fernando. Whoops. <laughs> Oops, my bad. <laughs> right. Though Hugh had been dead for nearly seven centuries, Fernando had never recovered from the loss. Gal Glass doubted that he ever would. And so Fernando continues to explain, as for my being in a Clermont, Philippe disagreed. So Gal Glass resumed his picking at the wax, and <laughs> Fernando poured two glasses yep. of red wine and carried them to the table. Here, you'll need your strength today, too. <laughs> Have some wine. Right. <laughs> <laughs> sure he's not italian that's kind of that's kind of an italian coping me- mechanism i thought she's he about was to hit the fan, have something to drink <laughs> <laughs> she's about to hit, hit the fan have something to drink have some vino dude let me top that off for you <laughs> So I was excited when I first read this that Mart, yay, yay, one of my favorites. Yay! She bustled into the kitchen. Isabeau's housekeeper ruled over this part of the chateau and was not pleased to see intruders in it. Yeah, it sounds like she gave him the stinky boy look. Right? <laughs> Get the fuck out. Why are there stinky boys in my kitchen? <laughs> oh, my God. You're using my best pan. I'm going to beat you right. with it. <laughs> She goes, that's my best pan. And then Fernando's like, I know, that's why I'm using it. What? <laughs> He's so lucky he did not get bitch slapped with a, with a wooden spoon. Mm. He's so lucky right there. So me thinking the way I would if I were Mart, I'd be like, sure, you want to cook? Go ahead, cook. You better clean, too. But, you know, she was adamant. You do not belong in the kitchen, Don Fernando. Go upstairs. Take gallo glass with you. And then Mart took a packet of tea and a teapot from the shelf by the sink. Then she noticed the towel wrap pot was sitting on a tray next to the cups. Saucers, milk, and sugar. Her frown deepened. And Fernando wants to know, what's wrong with me being here? And then Mart says, you're not a servant. There's all sorts of bitterness going on. Fernando with yeah. not being a declarement. Mart saying he's not a servant. Get the fuck out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In this right here, she picked the lid off of the top of the pot and sniffed suspiciously at its contents. Did she think he made her that damn the tea? Damn tea. <laughs> it's the damn tea. <laughs> Back. <laughs> uh, it's Diana's favorite. You told me what she liked, remember? Fernando smiles sadly. And everyone in this house serves the De Claremont's Mart. The only difference... You just get a paycheck, I don't. Right. The only difference is you, Alain, and Victoire are paid handsomely to do so. The rest of us are expected to be grateful for the privilege. Mm. So did he know that Diana was there and they're just waiting to be summoned? <laughs> like they don't want to rush out and... It's kind of. Kind of. I think <laughs> the whole like household it. knew. Yeah. So they're kind of like trickling in one by one to go meet this crazy crazy Diana Bishop lady. You know? <laughs> uh-huh. I don't know. Matthew's crazy witch wife, right. you know, and they're already yeah. they're already wary of Matthew and <laughs> Who knows who the fuck she, he's bringing home for real? Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, except Martin Isabel. Right. And Marcus, somewhat. Mm-hmm. But he's still warning Phoebe, like, stay the fuck away from him. And so, mm. yeah. Okay. So we're kind of getting a different view of Matthew through the family's eyes. And it's like, well, what the fuck? <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, it's, this it's, is, this is, it's disorienting. Yeah. It's change. Yes. <laughs> We're not good with change. Maybe that's a part of it, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Just like Diana, we're not good with change. You're right. <laughs> All right. And so the, after uh, Fernando's privileged speech, Mark goes, with good reason, other manja song dream of being part of this family. See that you remember that in the future. And the lemon, Dom Fernando. And I guess he, he forgot the lemon. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Bad. Mart said, placing emphasis on his lordly title. What does Dom mean besides dominant and... Uh, it's like a lord. Yeah. And I, I... I think it's the Spanish, Spanish equivalent to lord or duke. I'm not quite sure how far in the hierarchy it is, but it, it's at least a lord, if not a duke. Okay. It's good to know. So Mart said, placing emphasis on his lordly title. She picked up the tea tray. By the way, your eggs are burning. <laughs> so Fernando's like, oh, shit. <laughs> he leapt up to rescue them. And then Mart says... 
pass for you. And then she fixed her black eyes on Gal Glass. You did not tell us everything you should have about Matthew and his wife. And then Gal Glass looked down at his wine with a guilty expression. Oh, oh shit. <laughs> but wait, there's wait. more. <laughs> All right. But wait. But wait. Madame, your grandmother will deal with you later. And on that bone chilling note, Mart stalked out of the room. And then Fernando. Man, she was pissed. Right. Mm-hmm. And Fernando asked, what have you done now? Shit. <laughs> Putting his tortilla, which was not ruined, by the way. All hum. Do Lila. Do Lila. What does that mean? Like, thank God. Or praise to be. Thank praise, be God. praise God. Yeah, God. Praise yeah. God. Okay. Yeah. On the stove. Long experience had taught him that whatever the mess, Galglass had made it with good intentions and complete disregard for possible disaster. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> Oopsie. Oh, well. He meant well, though, right? (laughs) So Galagos says, well, and he's drawing out the vowels as only a Scot could. I might have left one or two things out of the tail. And then Fernando says, like Like what? what? (laughs) And I like this line. Fernando said, catching a whiff of catastrophe among (laughs) among the kitchen kitchen's only sense. That I highlighted too. This is like this is so it's so perfect. This is gonna end bad. That's what I just interpreted yeah. that. It's like, oh, <laughs> whatever. This is gonna end bad. Okay, so uh Gal Glass explains like the fact that uh Auntie is pregnant and by none other than Matthew, and the fact that granddad adopted her as a daughter. Lord his blood vow was deafening. And I'm like, Oh, he can hear it? What? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, and what's the fine line between not your tale to tell and spill it all? Yeah. At least give me the highlights. Something. <laughs> yeah. So Galglass looked reflective. Do you think we'll still be able to hear it? And I, at this point, reading it. Right. <laughs> he sounds like Jack in this this exchange, which is kind of hilarious. And I'm thinking, hear what? What is he hearing? What? (laughs) Explain this to me. Right. Fernando stood open mouth and silent. Don't look at me that way. It didn't seem right to share the news about the babe. Women can be funny about such things. And Philippe told Auntie Varen about the blood vow before he died in 1945. And she never said a word either. I can just see him crossing his arms. She didn't say anything either. So what? <laughs> don't, get, don't, don't start jumping. I didn't think shit. they were right. supposed to, though. Yeah, right. they weren't. No, they weren't. But I, I still love that he sounds, he sounds like Jack. <laughs> right. <laughs> A concussion tore the air as if a silent bomb had been detonated. Something green and fiery streaked past the kitchen window. And then Fernando's like, what the hell was that? And he flung the window door open and he's shielding his eyes against this bright sunlight. And I'm like, yeah, what the hell was that? (laughs) I don't know. And then Galgas says, one pissed off witch, I imagine. Sarah must have told Diana and Matthew the news about Emily. Not the explosion, that. And Fernando's pointing to San Lucian's bell tower, which was being circled by a winged, two legged, fire breathing creature. And that told me, I was like, oh shit, Cora made it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, cool. <laughs> Gal Glass explains, that's Cora. She goes wherever Auntie goes. But that's a dragon, Fernando turned his wild eyes on his stepson. Bah! That's no dragon. Can't you see she's only got two legs? Cora's a fire drake. <laughs> That's cute. <laughs> and Galaglass twists his arm to show off a tattoo of a winged creature that strongly resembled the airborne beast. There you go. Like this. Yep. I might have left one or two details, but I did warn everybody that Auntie Diana wasn't going to be the same which she was before. I did tell you guys. I warned you. I just didn't, you know. Mm. And in all fairness, it's been 400 plus years since I've seen her. Right. I didn't (laughs) know. (laughs) I don't know how this whole time walking thing was going to work out. I mean, I'm a vampire, but my memory is not that photogenic, but a while. (laughs) It's like the Amazon toilet paper as of right now. Right. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) This is how it is. This is how it is. Yes. It's true, honey. M is dead. Oh, oh, I forgot to change scenes. Let's do our little magical music right here. And we're in a different scene. So, it's true, honey, M is dead. The stress of telling Diana and Matthew was clearly too much for her. Sarah could have sworn she saw a dragon. Uh, spoiler, Sarah, you did. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 
Fernanda was right. She needed to cut back on the whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> and here's Diana. I don't believe you. Diana's voice was high and sharp with panic. She searched Isabeau's grand salon as though she expected to find Emily hiding behind one of the ornate settees. Um, no, Diana, she's not there, really. And uh, Matthew's like, yeah, no, really, Emily's not here, Diana. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I can't smell her. She's gone. No. And this is Diana. She tried to push past him and continued her search. But Matthew drew her into his arms. I am so sorry, Sarah. Matthew said, holding Diana tight to his body. Don't say you're sorry. And this is Diana. She's she's upset. She's struggling to free herself from the vampire's unbreakable hold. She pounded on Matthew's shoulder with her fist. M isn't dead. This is a nightmare. Wake me up, Matthew, please. I want to wake up and find we're still in 1591. And Sarah's like, this isn't a nightmare. The long weeks had convinced her that M's death was horribly real. Then I took a wrong turn or tied a bad knot in the time walking spell. This can't be where we were supposed to end up. And this is Diana. She's really upset. And promised she would never leave without saying goodbye. And yeah, that does suck. Yeah. Sorry. Em didn't have time to say goodbye to anyone, but that doesn't mean she didn't love you. Sarah reminded herself of this a hundred times a day. And then Marcus is like, yeah, Diana should sit. You know, pulling out a chair. In many ways, Matthew's son looked like the same 20-something surfer who had walked into the Bishop House last October. His leather cord, with its strange assortment of objects gathered over the centuries, were still tangled in the blonde hair at the nape of his neck. The Converse sneakers he loved remained on his feet. The guarded, sad look on it in his eyes was new, however. Hmm. Sarah was grateful mm. for the presence of Marcus and Isabeau, but the person she really wanted at her side at this moment was Fernando. Oh. He had been a rock Aww. during this whole ordeal. Hmm. So that got me thinking when I first read this. It's like, oh, Sarah and Fernando get along. OK, what's that like? Matthew thanks Marcus. He settles Diana in the seat. Phoebe tried to press a glass of water into Diana's hand when Diana just stared at it blankly. Who are you? Matthew. Yeah, I know. <laughs> no. Sit down. <laughs> Have several seats, please. Human. Right. <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't know. Maybe she thought she was being helpful, but you got a whole bunch of vampires in the room. Did you not believe, Marcus, these people can tear you right. apart? Right. Or maybe maybe know. Phoebe's like, you people are doing nothing. This woman needs comfort. She needs water yeah. or something. <laughs> Matthew took it and placed it on a nearby table. So that just tells you Phoebe was not paying attention. Phoebe said, fuck it. And if Matthew's close enough to take that water from Phoebe. Yeah. She was not she was, obeying the rules. She was not obeying anything. Okay. Yeah. And Matthew's pretty much and nothing pat, happened. pat, thank you for the water. Yeah. Let me just put it over Thanks here. <laughs> By the way, who are right. you? <laughs> take another seat, please. And, and you are. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a human servant in the house now. Right. All eyes alight. <laughs> on Sarah. Sarah was no good at this kind of thing. Diana was the historian in the family. She would know where to start and how to string the confusing events into a coherent story with a beginning, a middle, and the end, and perhaps even a plausible explanation of why Emily had died. And I would like one. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Um, Where's my chair? I'm going to just pull up and settle that's in That's right. Tell I us a story. A, I need an explanation, Diana. Thank you. Uh, Sarah starts. There's no easy way to tell you this. And Matthew's like, you don't have to tell us anything. And his eyes were filled with compassion and sympathy. The explanations can wait. No, you both need to know. And this is Sarah. She reached for the glass of whiskey. Fuck the water for her. <laughs> I mean, thank God. Matthew's always yeah, like, I can like, wait. No, I can't. Mm -mm. Yeah. So Sarah's got a whiskey and she looked to Marcus in mute appeal. Marcus is like, Emily died up the old temple. I guess he's telling a story now. And Diana's like, the temple dedicated to the goddess? Sarah says, yes. And she croaked, coughing to dislodge the lump in her throat. Because, you know, she's been drinking and smoking. She's not doing good anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Emily. And, she's, and no one's sneaking the decaf in anymore. No, no. <laughs> There's no brakes on this fucking train. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Emily was spending more and more time up there. And Matthew's expression, no longer warm and understanding, asked, was she alone? And then silence descended again. This one heavy and awkward. And Sarah's like, Emily wouldn't let anyone go with her. Marcus tried to convince her to take someone with her, but Emily refused. And Diana wanted to know, why did she want to be alone? What was going on, Sarah? 
And Sarah explains, since January, M had been turning to the higher magics for guidance. And me, myself, as the reader, I was like, what? Right. Yeah. Why? Wait a minute here. Yeah. Okay. So Sarah looked away from Diana's shocked face. She was having a terrible, she was having terrible premonitions of death and disaster and thought they might help her figure out why. And then Diana says, but M always said, but, 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 but <laughs> this is the things you people taught me. So ignore it, you know, don't do as I say, not, not as, as I, I do. do. Right. But M always said higher magics were too dark for witches to handle safely. She said any witch who thought she was immune to their dangers would find out the hard way just how powerful they were. And Sarah's like, she spoke from experience. They can be addictive. Emily didn't want you to know that she felt their lure, honey. She hadn't touched a scrying stone or tried to summon a spirit for decades. And Matthew's like, wait, what? Summon spirits? What, what, what? Hmm. And the aside here is with his dark beard, he looked truly terrifying. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> I think that's a matter of opinion. Right. <laughs> we've been stuck with him. You say terrifying, I say hi. Uh, we've been stuck with that shit all through Prague. It's not even <laughs> fucking terrifying anymore right. to us anyway. It's not terrifying anymore. It's just interesting. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's an option. I think she was trying to reach Rebecca. If I'd realized how far she'd gone in her attempts, I would have tried harder to stop her. And then uh, Sarah's starting to tear up here. Peter Knox must have sensed the power Emily was working with and the higher magics have always fascinated him. Once he found her, Matthew's like, Knox? When we found M, Knox and Gerbert were there too. And this is Marcus trying to, you know, put his input. She suffered a heart attack. Emily must have been under enormous stress trying to resist whatever Knox was doing. She was barely conscious. I tried to revive her. So did Sarah. But there was nothing either of us can do. Heart attack. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> I thought that, but then I thought he wouldn't have wanted to kill her. He wanted information from her. Yeah. yeah. Unless she really resisted and he was just pissed off. Right. I, I don't think he gave her the heart attack, but I, I think the heart attack was a result he of, caused it. of everything they were doing. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he didn't give her the heart attack like the stroke with the librarian, but he certainly caused it because whatever he was trying sure. to do right. caused her to push back to the point where her heart came And now you can, you can picture it better because of the TV show. Yeah. Did not care about her health or well-being. Oh, I think we're really going to picture it in the TV show. I'm just saying what we've seen so far was sad too. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm just, I'm just saying I think they actually filmed the death scene. So it made the script. Why were Jerbear and Knox here? And what in the world did Knox hope to gain by killing M? I don't think Knox was trying to kill her, honey, Sarah replied. Knox was reading Emily's thoughts or trying his best to her last words were I know the secret of Ashmole 782 and you will never possess it and then Diana looks stunned he's like shit if you would have kept her alive that would have saved me a lot of time <laughs> right <laughs> yeah <laughs> See, but it's interesting because in the beginning when they, when Philippe and Emily were on the roof, Philippe says she's afraid of what she must become. And now you he hear that Emily knows the secret of Ashmole 782. So they both kind of know the same thing. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and the interesting thing is like she says that I know the secret of 782 and you will never possess it. Well, Knox can never possess it because he's not a weaver. Mm -hmm. He, the secret, I mean, the secret is procreation and he can't do it. He could probably possess it physically, but not like Diana. Right. Spoiler. <laughs> no, I mean, he can have, he can hold on to the book, yeah, but yeah. that's about it. He'd open that's it up point. and be like, what the fuck is this shit? <laughs> anyway. Fuck this shit I'm out. Right? <laughs> fuck this shit I'm out. Diana looks stunned. Are you sure? Positive. Sarah wished her niece had never found the damn manuscript at the Bodleian Library. It was the cause of most of their present problems. Well, she's not wrong. It's true. <laughs> no, she isn't wrong. Knox insisted that the de Claremonts had missing pages from Diana's manuscript and knew its secrets, Isabeau chimed in. Vera and I told Knox he was mistaken, but the only thing that distracted him from the subject was the baby Margaret. Nathaniel and Sophie followed us to the temple. Margaret was with them, Marcus explained to answer Matthew's <laughs> astonished stare. I, you know what? I think Matthew, Matthew for once is standing in Baldwin's shoes because he has <laughs> had this perpetual reaction of what the fuck? 
What the fuck are you like, people doing? What are you people doing? Right. You did what? You let them come up. Where? What are you thinking? And she it's was like, by herself. Yeah. I mean, I, I think he's just starting to maybe he'll reflect back on this feeling in this moment later on and realize it's like, shit, maybe that's why Baldwin is so cranky all those things. Right. Right. <laughs> right. This, this, this shit is like annoying. <laughs> You guys are reactionary. You guys didn't plan. You guys, everything we yell at Matthew for. Yeah, <laughs> I know. It's like now, now he's got to sit there and go, "What?" Yeah. Matthew came home to the equivalent of the '80s movie House Party. <laughs> you know? Yes. Oh my god! Oh, but bad, yeah, but bad. But right. like the worst, worst, yes. the worst version possible of it. scenarios. Yeah. Right. <laughs> worst possible version of it. House Party cross with Weekend at Bernie. <laughs> what was that movie? Recent one where they all go to Las Vegas. It was a bachelor party. Some and Mike Tyson was in it. Yeah, yeah. And, yes. yeah. <laughs> what, oh, oh God, lost. Now it wasn't Lost Weekend. Yeah, bachelor party. I know which bachelor one you're talking. Party was yeah, it? Yeah, it's bachelor party. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's what he came home to. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Okay, so before Emily fell unconscious, Knox saw Margaret and demands to know how two demons had given birth to a baby witch. Knox invoked the covenant. He threatened to take Margaret to the congregation, pending investigation to what he called serious breaches in law. But seriously, was that breaches in law when two demons are mating and they have a witch? Yeah. That's not a breach no. in law. Yeah. No. No. Knox. Jerk. Anyway. And two witches throw off a demon baby? I don't know. Is that a breach in law? Or maybe you should sit down and think about... Yeah, think about things. Right. <laughs> you young man need to sit down and think about think things. About things. <laughs> He's going to invoke the letter of the law to investigate further. Yes. <laughs> Sounds like somebody else. Right. Someone should look into that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> While we were trying to revive Emily and get the baby to safety, Gerbert and Knox slipped away. Of course they did, because they're slippery. Of course they did. Mm -hmm. Until mm -hmm. recently, Sarah had always seen the congregation and the covenant as necessary evils. It was not easy for three otherworldly species, demons, vampires, and witches, to live among humans. All had been targets of human fear and violence at some point in history. And creatures had long ago agreed to a covenant to minimize the risk of the world's coming to human attention. In uh, limited fraternization between species, as well as any participation in human religion or politics, the nine member congregation enforced the covenant and made sure that creatures abided by the terms. Now that Diana and Matthew were home, the congregation could go to hell and take their covenant with them as far as Sarah was concerned. I agree, mm -hmm. Sarah. Diana's head swung around and a look of disbelief passed over her face. Galaglass? She breathed as the salon filled with the scent of the sea. Welcome home, Auntie. Galaglass stepped forward, his golden beard gleaming where the sunlight struck it. Diana stared at him in astonishment before a sob broke free. There, there. I keep thinking of... There's a lot of pat pat yeah. going on in this character. This is the one with the pat pat. Right. <laughs> They're there. They're there. <laughs> or the social distancing, they're there with a long yes. arm. Right. <laughs> uh, Galaglass lifted her into a bear hug. It's been some time since the sight of me has brought a woman to tears. Besides, it really should be me weeping at a reunion. As far as you're concerned, it's only been a few days since we spoke. By my reckoning, it's been several centuries. Something... <sighs> Numinous? Okay. Numinous. I think it's supposed to be luminous. No, I think I, no, Deb had said that that was right. Okay. Let's let's do a quick yeah. look up here. Yeah. Numinous. Having strong religious or spiritual quality, indicating or suggesting the presence of a divinity. Oh God. Oh, she's mean. What? Who's I think it's for I, I think she, she, yeah, that's right. And I think it was foreshadowing, but none of us bothered to look right. at all. Right. We just assumed it was luminous. I did too. Yeah. I remember yeah, I remember someone asking her and she's like, No, that's right. Oh, okay. So, audience, again, having a strong religious or spiritual quality indicating or suggesting the presence of a divinity. So that's what numinous means. It's a goddess. It's not luminous, it's numinous. Yay! It's numinous. We learn Yay. new words. The more you know. <laughs> Flickered around the edges of Diana's body. Like 
like a candle. I uh, see that's where it threw us. Right. The candle. Yeah. Right. Like a candle slowly catching the light. Sarah blinked. She was really going to have to lay off the booze. <laughs> oh, <fuck. laughs> but it's funny it, because Deb did say it's right. And here we're like, she's acting like Matthew, like telling you straight out. No, it's right. And we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll just read it as luminous anyways. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the editor's we're fucked all up. Matthew sometimes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit i didn't know that somebody had asked her and she said no 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 that's right <laughs> yeah this is really interesting now right because when i read through that and i i skimmed over in my head i saw luminous but i was like it well, stopped me <laughs> and as this sequence goes on then it, it just reinforces your desire to read it as luminous because they're all like yeah 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 it's just her disguising spell got knocked right. sideways and her mm -hmm. glam is showing and it's like well no Oh, it's not because that's not what the word means. <laughs> oh, well, we're smarter well. today. <laughs> Angela knew, but we're smarter. You and me, Jean, we're smarter yeah, today. We're so much smarter today. Thank right. you, Angela. You made us smarter. Well, not, yeah, but not that I still read it that way. I didn't read it the right way either. <laughs> but now that we read it that way, it's like either, you know, hey, it's the like goddess seal of approval on her or is the goddess, goddess somehow present with, is it either or both or mm. something else? No, no, it gives me something to ponder. Right? All the pondering. <laughs> so much pondering. Pondering and Pats is what this chapter is all about. <laughs> Pats and pondering. That would have been a better title. <laughs> Maybe do a search uh, in the group for uh, Numinous. Because Numinous. I don't know where I saw it, but I would think by now I would have had to have been out of the group. I'm thinking, I'm wondering if that was Twitter. I, no, I just looked on Twitter. It wasn't, I'd see, at least it didn't come up. Okay. I, I'll look in the group. Yeah. But I, I, I think I would have been out of the group by this point in the book. I think you were. Yeah. yeah. So Matthew and his nephew exchanged glances. Matthew's expression grew even more concerned as Diana's tears increased and the glow surrounding her intensified. Galgas says, let Matthew take you upstairs. And he reached into a pocket and pulled out a crumpled yellow bandana. He offered it to Diana, carefully shielding her from view. Is she all right? Sarah asked. Just a wee bit tired. No big deal. Fucking take your glowing wife upstairs, dude. Right. <laughs> Fuck. Dude, this is, this is problematic. Get her upstairs. Right. Once Diana and Matthew were gone, Sarah's fragile composure cracked and she began to weep. Reliving the events of M's death was a daily occurrence, but having to do so with Diana was even more painful. Fernando appeared, his expression concerned. It's all right, Sarah. Let it out. Pat, pat. <laughs> <laughs> Where were you when I needed you, Sarah demanded as her weeping turned on to sobs. I'm here now, Fernando said, rocking her gently. And Diana and Matthew are safely home. So, okay, Fernando, you put up with that shit from Sarah? Good for you. And Diana, I guess we're in a new scene now because the star, star, star showed up again. I can't stop shaking. And this is Diana. Her teeth were chattering and her limbs were jerking as if being pulled by invisible strings. Gal Glass pressed his lips together, standing back while Matthew wrapped a blanket tightly around his wife. That's the shock, Moncour. And this is Matthew letting her know. Can you get some wine, Gal Glass? Diana's like, I shouldn't. The babies. And her expression turned wild and her tears returned. They'll never know M. Our children will grow up not knowing M. Here, Gal Glass thrusts a silver flask in Matthew's direction. <laughs> <laughs> Give her some of this. <laughs> yeah. Little hair of the dog. <laughs> Shove it down her mouth. Yeah. Uh, so sure he's not part demon. He's always prepared. I know. <laughs> <laughs> he probably has a lipstick in one of those pockets, too. Right. Who knows? And some Ray-Bans. Dude. So Matthew takes the flask and he's like, even better. And they pull the stopper free. Just a sip, Diana. It won't hurt the twins. It'll help calm you. Trust me, Diana. It will. Mm -hmm. I'll have Mart bring up some black tea with plenty of sugar. I'm going to kill Peter Knox. And this is Diana after she took some whiskey. Yeah, I'm telling you, some liquid courage. Right. That'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it lightened up her glam, too. Right? <laughs> Just... Not today you're not, Matthew said firmly, handing the flask back to Galglass. Has Auntie's glam been this bright since your return? And Galglass hadn't seen Diana Bishop since 1591, but he didn't remember it being that bright. Right. <laughs> <laughs> What the hell's going on here? Yes. And this is Matthew. She's been wearing a disguising spell. The shock must have knocked it out of place. Matthew said, lowering her onto the sofa. 
Diana wanted Emily and Sarah to enjoy the fact that they were going to be grandmothers before they started asking questions about her increased power. Yeah, but she's been wearing, she was wearing a disguising spell all along when she was back in London, moving through St. Paul's and that. Right. Right. But Gail Glass she had started seen training with the glam, though. He had seen it. Coven. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm saying I, I would have thought that he would also realize that she had on, had a disguising spell on, too. And in fact, he did. He knew she was using a disguising spell because she... He said, you might want to get a bit they shiny. They were messing with it in, right. in Prague when they were at St. Vitus. Right. To get the... He said, you might get, want to get a more little bit more shiny. You might want to shake your disguising spell a little bit and get yeah, shiny. So yeah, I, I mean, remember. He knew about it. Continuity or... Either I mean, that... Or Matthew's like... T- Either that or it was so bright after they time yeah. walked back that maybe he could still see it under the disguising spell. That's me reaching. Yeah, I don't, it's just it's just weird because it just sounds like Matthew's telling him, hey, yeah, you know, she started using this disguising spell like Galaglass wouldn't have known that. Right. Which is, right. that's my point. It's just kind of weird. Right. So Matthew asked better and Diana nodded. Her teeth were still chattering, Galglass noted. It made him ache to think about the effort it must be taking for her to control herself. I'm so sorry about Emily, Matthew said, cupping her face between his hands. And Diana wanted to know, is it our fault? And Galglass is like, of course not. Peter Knox did this. Nobody else is to blame. And Matthew says, let's not worry about who's to blame. But his eyes were angry. You know, <laughs> <Uh-oh>. <laughs> I'll worry about that. Shit. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Galaglass gave him a nod of understanding. Matthew would have plenty to say about Knox and Gerber later. Right now, he was concerned with his wife. Emily would want you to focus on taking care of yourself and Sarah. That's enough for now. And Dinah's like, I should go back downstairs, drawing Galaglass's bright yellow bandana to her eyes. Sarah needs me. Let's stay up here a little bit longer longer. Wait for Mark to bring the tea. <laughs> Matthew's like, no, <laughs> you're, you're going to stay up here. Diana slumped against him, her breath hiccuping in and out as she tried to hold back the tears. And Gal Glass is like, yeah, I'll leave you too. Okay. And then Matthew's nodding back. Yeah, thanks, man. And Diana says, thank you, Gal Glass, holding out the bandana. Keep it, he said, turning for the stairs. We're alone. You don't have to be strong now. And this is Matthew murmuring to Diana as Gal Glass descended down the twisting staircase. Galaglass left Matthew and Diana twined together in an unbreakable knot, their faces twisted with pain and sorrow, each giving the other comfort that they could not find for themselves. All right. So here's this last part I kind of forgot about when we were going through this. Oh, this is a crazy Mm -hmm. part. Right. So change in scene, everybody. We're back with Ghost Emily and she's got uh, a friend with her. I should never have summoned you here. I should have found another way to get my answers. Emily turned to face her closest friend. You should be with Stephen. So Rebecca Bishop says, I'd rather be here with my daughter than anywhere else. Stephen understands. Philippe chimes in. Do not fear. Matthew will take care of her. He was still trying to figure out Rebecca Bishop. She was an unusually challenging creature, as skilled at keeping secrets as any vampire. They'll take care of each other, Rebecca said, her hand cover over her heart, just as I knew they would. And that's end chapter. I know. Anything that we left out. Is there anything you no, want to cover? It was a very meaty yeah, I'll say So much. All right. So let's gavel this. Going once, going twice. So. Yay. And uh, that was a good chapter. Yeah. Good chapter. Yes. It was good for us to revisit that. And slowly. Yeah, and there's so much in there. I know. There's so much in there. Slow as she goes. All right. So let's go on to housekeeping. This housekeeping is brought to us by Susie Glenn. Thank you, Thank Susie. Thank you, Susie. Thank you, Susie. Housekeeping. All right. Who's got something for housekeeping? I do. And it is from our vampire nurse from the Bay Area, Elizabeth. Ooh. Hi, Elizabeth. I love a vampire is coming out of the woodwork. Good to see you. I know. <laughs> finally. Hello, dear demons. I just want to say hi and thank you for making me laugh and at least forget all the worries we're facing, especially as I am one of the nurses that do take care of patients that come in sick, whether they have COVID or suspecting of having it in labor and delivery. Bless you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for doing everything that you do. Yes. I listen to your podcast on my way to and from work. You have no idea how it brightens me up before work, ready to tackle my shift. Thank you so much for being a ray of sunshine. It's the least we can do. Oh, yeah. I know. Sorry I didn't have anything to say about the first chapter of Book of Life. So exhausted after work, I didn't have the time, but I just needed to thank you all. Can't wait to hear the next podcast. You guys rock. Love you, demons. The vampire nurse from the Bay Area, Elizabeth. Ah, we love you back. We love you right back. We love you back. Stay strong. You got this. You got this. 
Yep. Angela, did you say you wanted to go last? Yeah, I'll go last. Okay. So I have a Google voicemail from Kimberly. All these new Ooh, voices we're hearing. Yay. All right. So here's what Kimberly had to say. Hi, guys. This is Kimberly from California. Love the podcast. My question is, in the book series, Hamish, my favorite demon, is a fashionably gay demon. But in the show, they made him straight. I wasn't cool with that. I just don't understand why they did that. Was it just because they didn't read into it? Or the writer of the show didn't understand? I don't know. I didn't understand. And Deborah was on set all the time. Maybe you guys can shed light into this. Thank you so much. And you guys have a wonderful Easter. Bye. Yay. Oh. Yay. You too, Kimberly. Hope your Easter is great. Yeah. yeah. And for you guys listening, Easter has passed. But okay. Now we've time stamped us and you know when it was. There you go. <laughs> okay. So who wants to tackle Kimberly's question there? I think we could all tackle yeah. that because. I think we can. Uh, well, well, I was deferring to you since you're Hamish's. Right. Right. Champion. They did not say he was not gay. They didn't make him straight. That's for sure. I can say definitively <laughs> he was not straight. And maybe yeah. I'm biased because I had read the books and I had already had a picture in my mind right. of how he was. But as soon as he stepped out of his house with that outfit, girl, I was done. I'm like, oh, yeah, that man's gay. Yeah, I just, his, I just his, transferred. <laughs> yeah, his house looked like yes. a wedding cake. Come on. I mean, not uh-huh. to stereotype, but come on. <laughs> <laughs> he was awfully overdressed for a weekend slumming at the country house. Right. They didn't make him straight. That's for sure. But they didn't define him either as gay. Yeah. So we we just didn't hear about Sweet William. That's all. Yeah, I think that was the the one big clue that we got in the book that he definitely was. Right. But thanks for calling, Kimberly. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Awesome. And I can see how I can see how people maybe coming to through the series first wouldn't necessarily conclude that he's gay and yeah. maybe he's just like the crazy ex- eccentric guy, especially given Greg McHugh's background in comedy. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. So I can certainly see where you'd go to that conclusion if you hadn't had hadn't read right. the books before. And I was just being lazy. And I just projected what was in the books onto the TV show. Oh, same here. Right. Oh, totally. As <laughs> soon as he walked on that staircase in the aisle, I'm like, oh, darling. Right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Angela, what do you have for us? I have a five star review. <laughs> I think we kind of went out of order, but it, rest assured, we will never not read a five star review. That's for sure. <laughs> And this is from Tedder76. The title is Yay! Substantive, Engaging, and Thoroughly Entertaining. Well, good. This is by far the best huh. podcast related to the All Souls trilogy world. The discussions are incredibly insightful, well-researched, entertaining, and grounded with humor and extraordinary chemistry between these three powerhouse women. It's incredibly refreshing to hear smart, clever, real women have a very real conversation about these characters, situations, and relativity to our own world, laced with sass, relatable realness, and truth. The banter is non Replicable, and this will fast become your go-to podcast for insight, perspective, and escapism into the All Souls universe. Beautiful job, Demon Queens. Wow. Yeah, that's just like, whoa. <laughs> that is amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much. Tetter 76. Wow. My ego wow. needed a boost in that day. Right? Wow. wow. That coupled with the upbeat voicemail from Kimberly and now this, I feel good today. Right. Oh, I know. All right. With that, we're on to save it for the show. So this this episode, Save for the Show, is brought to us by Amy Austin Taggart. Thank you, Amy. I hope you're hanging Thank in there. Thank you, Amy. And Amy's also probably a perfect person to be our guardian angel on the Save It for the Show since she is also an author. Yay. All right. As well. So in our Save for the Show today is the intellect, uh, what I like to call our intellectual property reminder, a.k.a. don't be a pirate. Save it for the show. Save it for the show. Save it for the show. Guys, save it for the show. Don't be a pirate. No matter, how, no matter how hot Matthew may look as one, don't be a pirate. Don't be that pirate. R. Yes. R. All right. So, yeah, it's come up again. I think a part of the problem is, is that everybody's cooped up and looking for things to do that's not going to cost them any money. Give us the background on this because I'm oh, not. Oh, in, in one of the other groups, somebody was posting about places where you could find free copies of 
Deb's books. No! Oh. Yes, Torrent. No! Don't do it. And, and yeah, well, you know me, that's the hill I die on. Right. So I, I brought it up and this person who is in a leadership position, but rather than instruct people that you don't advertise those sites, you don't get videos from those sites, you don't take your books from that site because it's stealing. Mm-hmm. Her comment was, well, you can't, you, just because you use it, you can't be thrown in jail or prosecuted. So they're not really doing anything wrong. Yeah, but Facebook can take down your whole group for that shit. Oh, yeah. Well, that's true, too. Mm, I, I'm just saying it's something. No, I'm just saying mm-hmm. that the logic was, well, you know, they're not really doing anything wrong because that's not me. It's just the person who's actually putting it up for people to find is the one that's in the wrong. Like, mm. You want to bet? Yeah. You want to bet? Because yeah. guess what? If you're down Downloading those things from like illegal sites, you're liable. Yep. I mean, that's Napster. Yeah. People got prosecuted on Napster. Yeah. That's why Napster fell down, totally fell down. And the people that they went after were just users. <sighs> and let me tell you, defending an intellectual property lawsuit costs a lot of money. Okay. So I know we're all quarantined. I know that we're not supposed to leave our houses. And I know we're not, a lot of people are on very tight budgets right now. I, I understand I realize that. that. But if you belong to a library, most of them yeah. issue free ebooks mm-hmm. for a period of time and it'll disappear yeah. off your Kindle after a period of time and just borrow it again if you need to read it again. Not to mention the fact that not all ebooks, but there are certainly a number of ebooks that you can purchase through Barnes and Noble, Amazon, any reputable site mm-hmm. that are lendable. Yes. yes. It's a book by book thing, but check your ebooks. You may be able to lend them out to your friends. And legally. I do believe a Discovery of Witches was two ninety nine on Kindle the yes. other day. It's still it was like up until maybe two days ago. Right. So why it would still you? Is, so. Why would you? I understand and financial times are tough, but like there's the library, there's mm-hmm. there, there are so many ways to. Yeah. And I mean, and, and the simple fact of the matter is, is that you've got an admin of a group advocating this behavior. No, um, no, uh, no. It was absolutely appalling. Yeah. In good times or bad, you're, you're always hurting the source. Yeah. Ultimately. Absolutely. And the same thing is true for movies, too. Mm-hmm. Just viewing them, you're complicit in the, in the theft. Because the thing of it is, with either a book or a film, you're depriving the creator of of the fee you would have otherwise paid. Yep. And the problem becomes that without the views, without the licensing fees, without the buying the books, you may not get the next one in a series. Hmm. And that's especially true with independent authors and independent films. Yeah. You know, you've got people watching stuff on pirate download. You're not going to get a distribution contract for other countries. So people who want to see it legally may not get a chance to because the thieves ruin it for everybody. Always and them. This is, that's what's going on right now with a, there's actually this kind of like almost better done version of Fifty Shades of Grey with a, with a Italian actor and ma, it's mafia, you know, Russian and Italian mafia and everything else. And right. Snippets have been showing up everywhere. I think it's called DNI, DNI 365. There's a big problem with pirate copies of that showing up now. And they're really trying to hammer down a distribution deal with Netflix USA so everybody can see it legally. But, you know, you've got dumbasses posting the YouTube links for the illegal copies. Right. Pirating isn't good for any reason. Anybody. Yeah. No. No. I mean. It's the reason we can't have nice things. Yeah. I will say this, that even like on the small scale for us, uh, we have our Patreon episodes, but sometime last year, someone did, decided to download the Patreon episode and uh, put it up on SoundCloud for random people to just free. down for free. That hurts us. I mean, that's bottom yeah. line. That hurts us. So, and it hurts all the people who who do it, the, who have supported us, right. and who are abiding by the rules and do it the legal way. Right? It's bullshit. So, yes, we put down, we put up a takedown notice, and now because of that, and like Jean said, one person will ruin it for the bunch. Because of that, that person had come on, and before we we didn't have Patreon charged you until the following month. Now, patrons, if they want to join Patreon, they have to pay up front. Whatever they pledge, they have to pay up front. So before you even get anything, we have to charge you up front just to avoid that. I didn't think that was fair, but we had to do what we had to do yeah. because that's not even cool. It's like we're this little po down podcast. We're trying to keep it afloat. And here you are just, yeah, whatever, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> 
copyright law is there for a reason. Yeah, yeah. And and thankfully we you know, have institutions. It's, you're not cool. Yeah, it's not cool for you to like, ooh, look at me, I got this free. I'll, yeah. I'll tell you where to get it. Right. It's You're not cool and, and you expose yourself yeah, to... And you're a thief. And by the way, you know, if you download it, all the viruses you get from downloading it, you kind of deserve. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you expose yourself, right? Because <laughs> yeah. if that's on Facebook, now guess what? That whole... not We're not saying that we would do it, but somebody can turn around and say, you know what? Take down notice Facebook yeah. and Facebook would not hesitate. Nope. Ruining it for everybody else. Yeah. Anything to add, Angela? No. I don't know. <laughs> no. <laughs> this is my hill to die on. Yeah. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. No, it's not cool. So we good? We're good. We're, We're good. good. Download your certificates. You've been um, refreshed on copyright infringement. <laughs> You get one continuing education credit for that. Right, right. We'll be back next year. In the good year. fan college. <laughs> how, the how to be a good fan college. Right, right. We'll be back next year for your refreshers. Okay. <laughs> Stick with us. After this break, we'll think of last thoughts and things we can't let go of. So, yeah, there you go. Okay, thank you. <laughs> This podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you like to listen to your podcasts. You can contact us, send us your thoughts, email us at demonsdiscuss at gmail.com, leave us a voicemail at 360-519-7836, by the way, your carrier rates apply here, or leave one for free on SpeakPipe, speakpipe.com slant demonsdiscuss. Now, if you can't remember any of that, go to go.demonsdiscuss.com slant contact and all that information will be there. You can also become a discusser there, fill out the form, and bam, you're a discusser. And the link to join our Facebook group is there too. Visit our main site, demonsdomain.com. And if you really feel like deep diving, go to visit.demonsdomain.com slant master post. And you can read interviews, geek out with weekly geeks about all souls universe. Read about the characters. Keep that geek flag flying, guys. Do you like what we do? Help us fund what we do. Go to patreon.com slant demons discuss. Make sure you follow us on social media. We are on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, all at Demons Discuss. If you're liking what you're hearing and you want to tell the world about it, leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We love them. We read them. It's wonderful. Also, it keeps Angela alive, and we need her around, okay? Keep it alive. My last thought was last episode of when we talked about the end of Shadow of Night, when they time walked back and... I went off on this tangent about time travel and the multiverse and moving back to the future. And the other day there was a, a post in the large group that got me thinking about it more. I mean, the actual post was more parent shaming and whatnot uh, and was pretty much focused on the fact that Matthew and Diana left Annie and Jack behind. Yeah. And I know part of the reason they didn't bring them forward because you can't upset time. Right. And because they, they changed too much history. But I was also wondering that maybe whether in the bigger scheme of things and in the design of time, especially when you've got so many overlapping concurrent timelines and concurrent universes, really. Right. I'm also wondering if there isn't something, there, there isn't a built-in fail-safe because like a, an organism or, a, or the human body is a good example. You have an immune system that will attack, quote unquote, attack foreign invaders. Right. For lack of a very simple way of explaining it. Antibodies. I'm almost wondering. Yeah. Yeah. I'm almost wondering if time Time and the quantum mechanic physics of time doesn't have some sort of failsafe built into it that would almost prevent them from bringing them forward if they would bring something forward that would wreak so much havoc that it'd blow up the timeline. So essentially, your analogy is bringing the wrong thing into an environment that doesn't want them is going to bring up proverbial antibodies pushing them out. Like, yes. like if you bring Jack and Annie into 
to present time, time would not let you do that. Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 yes. I'm wondering if that that's something to consider as well. Right. I didn't mean to gene explain you, Jean. I was just explaining it to myself. (laughs) No, you didn't gene explain it because I was having a hard time articulating what I was trying to say. And I'm glad that you you understood where I was going with this. I was just trying to talk myself through that whole. (laughs) Yeah. Like okay, because I mean, I'm just wondering that even even if they did make the dumb decision to bring it forward, who's to say that time would have let them? Yeah, it could be. Right. I mean, your body regulates itself and time could be the same way. Yeah. And that's what kind of made me think about it, because we're all talking so much about viruses and antibodies and Mm. bacteria and everything else. And it's kind of like, well, what if time works the same way? (laughs) Well, why wouldn't it? Why wouldn't it? That's what I'm thinking, too. Because in a way, it's an organism. Physics is like a universal formula. You know what I mean? It's like what happens in religion, you can correlate it to physics. Yeah. Just, I, I, I think in these terms, it's like... It, Shelly, if you're out there, chime in. Right. <laughs> right. It's, I know physics isn't your thing, but maybe you understand the analogy you're right. trying to get at. The, the, well, science, the only science that I can grasp is physics. You know, <gasps> it, it's just like with every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. And that's with everything. And I believe Carolyn, who we met in Cardiff, mm-hmm. the math, our mathematician friend, yeah. she's still listening. Chime in, please. Well, Jacqueline mm-hmm. as well. She's a math mathematician. Yes. Yeah. From North Carolina. Shout out, shout out to our mathematicians and physicists. <laughs> So I agree with your, I, I, I agree and understand your theory. The only thing that could mess it up is magic. And that's the uh, well, disruptor. Yeah, there. I like magic. Magic solves a lot of problems. Right. <laughs> it's the Band-Aid. <laughs> it's like it's that the didn't work. Doll. It's the Band-Aid to all these theories. Right. <laughs> that's oh, throwing some magic. It's magic. It's cool. Works. <laughs> I don't like the thought of bringing yeah. forward Jack and Annie. I, I understand that it no, would make everything all nicey nice, but all. things have to be the way they are. And I can see arguing that magic, she could have overridden time somehow because she's this powerful yeah. leader, but I like the way it was. I like the way it was. And I don't like the argument that they were bad, quote unquote, parents for making the decisions they made. I mean, they had a situation and they did it the best they could. I mean, right. And then you'd go around changing a whole lot of other things deaths, Philippe's death. Yeah, and, right. You know, right. It's crazy talk. It's mayhem. It's It would all be mayhem. <laughs> and now I'm thinking of mayhem <laughs> from Allstate commercials. Yeah, no. well, that, it would be like the Allstate. I mean, it would be like the Allstate commercial for right. real. Yeah. Well, Stephen did point out that they messed up getting too enthralled and too involved in that their life. Mm-hmm. They, and they, they've picked up a couple kids. They did. Yeah. Had they not done all those things, then there'd be no need for this conversation. But they did do the, all those things and they had to make it right at the end when they traveled back as right as they could anyway I, I mean even though you're making a series of mistakes you can still try to correct it somewhat when you see you're fucking up stop fucking up so yeah <laughs> do you know what I mean yeah it's like, it's like oh I'm gonna continue to fuck up because fuck it I'm fucking up but no no when you realize you're fucking up stop the fucking up so that was their way of stopping the fucking well, up well Stephen had told her yeah. and I had accidentally popped into the audiobook and it was right when Father Hubbard was lecturing Diana on leaving Jack and Annie and he said it was your problem and you made it mine and she said yes but I set him up blah 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 so he gives her the whole lecture and he explains to her right. why, you know, and, and she explains why she couldn't bring him forward. Right. Because I was fucking yeah. up. Now I yeah. have to stop fucking up. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Basically. <laughs> Angela, do you have any last thoughts? Not really. It's going to bleed over into the after show because I don't know if you guys did it, but I have my would you rather questions. Oh, shit. I did it. I'm so unprepared. <laughs> but I look forward to that. We're going to play a, a game of would you rather and I have an all souls would you rather question. I have a bizarre would you rather question and just kind of like a regular, you know, not too trippy. <laughs> would you rather question? Would you rather question? Yeah. Okay. So patrons tune in next week for that. And uh, I guess after we're done here, I'm going to like quick do my homework. Because... <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I have failed. Dang. <laughs> I was counting on some of those questions coming in from patrons. Oh, fuck. <laughs> fail. Ultimate fail. Well, the reason anyway, it, didn't come so from patr- fail. it didn't come from patrons because we hadn't published that episode yet. Yeah, that's true. They, oh, they, good they, point. They wouldn't have known. They wouldn't have known. <laughs> I've lost all sense of time. Right? Damn, you, <laughs> Rona. damn you, Rona. <laughs> that damn Rona. 
<laughs> it's the Rona. It is. It's the Rona it passage is. of time. Okay. So my last thought is I am glad we're feeling better than we did last time we recorded. Yes. Last time was all gloom and doom and like, wow, oh, this sucks. But I am so happy to talk to you guys, uh, Angela and Jean. Thank you for this today. Yes. And we're happy to talk to you guys, audience. Thank you for calling in. Thank you for writing in. Thank you for the good reviews. Thank you, patrons, for whatever. You know, you guys could all have been like, oh, fuck it. I might be broke. I'm going to cancel. None of you did. Oh, so thank you so and Thank you for much. just your bright, bright outlooks and attitudes and good energy. Right. We all huddled on the Titanic raft. We all made it. We all fit. We all made it. We're all That's right. <laughs> We're cruising yes. to... Yes, Better there's times. enough room on the on the on the door. door. For yeah. We're not going to let Jack freeze. <laughs> no, there's enough room on the door for everyone, <laughs> and no one's going to be propeller guy, right? <laughs> Even with the Common Core mask, we're yes. not going to let anybody be the right. propeller guy. You know, I I help reckon with, and it's for sixth grade. Seriously, you're learning the surface area of a rectangular prism. <laughs> I I don't remember. What? Yeah, that's what it was. So I have to teach myself, then I teach Brecken, and now we both know it, but. You know what? I feel like such a failure at math, and then I teach myself. I'm like, shit! I could be a math professor. <laughs> <You know? laughs> totally, totally oh, untrue. No. Totally untrue. But that's a, that's the kind of confidence I get from yeah, co- conquering a, a problem. Ticket. Yeah, <laughs> right. Oh my God, that's such a D- John Lovitz response. Yeah. I could be a math professor. <laughs> <laughs> totally not the case. Yeah. I'm just that's for you. Do you want to save it for the after show? Sure. All right, let's do that. All right. Sure. Another reason you guys can, can become patrons, that's so you right. can find out. How Oh, the homeschooling is going with Angela. <laughs> Patreon.com slant demons discuss. There you go. Two bucks is all it takes. And you can continue the ride into the ditch with us. Anyway, uh, let me finish off my last thoughts. Uh, I want to say, please be safe, everybody. Keep your social distance. I don't know where we're at in this timeline because obviously we record two weeks to a month ahead. So hopefully we're further along and this will be old news by the time you hear it. But keep your distancing. It seems like we're kind of flattening the curve in some areas, but stay Not the others. course. Yeah. Stay the stay course. The course. <laughs> Politics aside, let me leave. Stay the fuck home. Let me leave right. you with uh, Cuomo's briefing quote. He quoted Churchill did it. Did you guys get to see that? No, I missed that. Today. It was really no. good. It was really good. But he quoted Churchill saying, now is not the end. Now is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. Woo. Wow. <laughs> so don't get lax. Keep and doing I'm what you're doing. It in his, in right. <laughs> daddy New Yorker voice. Right. <laughs> there we right. go. Hello. Mm. Again, come see us in the after show. We'll talk more. We'll talk more. <laughs> All right, guys. That's it for us. And let's say goodbye. Goodbye. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Mwah. Demon kiss. A socially distant demon kiss. <laughs> yes. <laughs> A virtual demon kiss. Right. And we'll talk to you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.